Hi folks, welcome to, um, well, I was going to say Politics Free Sunday because there's, <laughs> there's no Mars show today um, and the Brewer show, the Scottish politics show, obviously has to follow the Westminster um, politics. So even though Holyrood is back, our politics aren't allowed to start until Westminster's politics start on the BBC anyway. Yes, that's been the case for a very long time. Yeah. That's a BBC decision. I don't think it's Brewer's decision. So we're really going to be doing a newspaper report. So it'll be nothing but unionism. No? Oh, you don't yeah. look so you're convinced, lads. Um, Jimmy, you brought up Ian McQuarter's piece, and I take it in the Sunday Herald. Aye, aye. It's an interesting oh. piece, mate. Oh, um, I never saw that. It's 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 quite a good piece actually, Stuart. I mean, just it's again, it's about the salmon stuff that's gone on in this week. But um, it does point out a couple of interesting wee things that people tend to gloss over or forget about, like the fact that the um, disciplinary code that was brought in was a civil service disciplinary code that's never caught a single civil servant in any misbehaving whatsoever. It's only caught one person, that person being Mr. Salmon. And that kind of disappears and is frequently um, ignored by the people who brought about this disciplinary code because at the end of the day, they don't want to be shown to have failed and clearly they've failed. But um, uh, it goes on to have a pop at Kirsty Work, um, which is absolutely acceptable in my point of view. But I think it's a, aye, he, he just basically points out that it's what we're watching or what we're seeing is a retrial of Alex Salmon. And I think like most, most fair-minded Scots, it's rather distasteful to think that somebody who was found innocent is yet again being tarred with a brush that, and it's a nasty brush as well, you know what I mean? These anonymous women are being given a heck of a platform by certain sections of the Scottish media. It is, I mean, we're now looking at three bites of the cherry for the attack on Alex Salmond. I mean, you're talking about an inquiry that failed on the grounds of possible bias, which was a civil service inquiry, the Scottish courts who found him not guilty, and now the inquiry that Murdo Fraser and Cole Hamilton have both made it very plain that they view this as another platform to attack Alex Salmond. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how anybody who's fair-minded can believe that the inquiry should be another platform to attack Alex Salmon. I mean, oh, it's, it's outrageous. Here's, mm. an, here's, a, here's an alternative point of view as well. Uh, is it really doing the unionist cause any good by removing Alex Salmon from the entire independence campaign? <laughs> I think about it that way, you know, he's a big beast. Well, what, they, what everybody has, sorry, what the unionist side had hoped for was there would be smear by um, association to the Salmond case. Yeah, but if they get rid of Alex Salmond, uh, then there's no, the, the row within the, the, the yes movement disappears. Well, technically, they already have got rid of Salmond. Aye, technically, oh, you're right. So, so, I mean, it doesn't help the unionist cause at all to keep going on about it. No, but they, they're now hoping that there's, there can be guilt by association for other members of the SNP, notably Nicola Sturgeon. Well, I think, I think that was the, yes, that, that's still their hope, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's and, interesting what McWhorter says, though. When he's talking about that, the first, the one, the civil case that Salmond won, and he's talking about the disciplinary code that was set in place. What he actually said, and that's specifically what the Parliament inquiry is about, is how that was set in place, why it was set in place, and why it failed. Really know anything, well, it is to do Alex Salmond, and the Tories will absolutely make sure they make it so, but 
what he actually says, and it's interesting that somebody like McWhirter has come out and said this. He says, that inquiry was ruled unlawful, unfair, and tainted by apparent bias. In other words, was a setup. Now, that's quite a strong thing for McWhirter to say, saying that it was a setup, but what other conclusions are we to reach when nobody else has fallen foul of that disciplinary code? And quite so much money has been spent defending that disciplinary code or not defending it. You know, the Scottish government paid out £512,000 to collapse a case, so they no longer had to defend that code. Well, look, somebody, and I wish I'd actually kept a note for it, somebody over a couple of days ago went into the detail of what we saw. Was it last Tuesday when they opened the inquiry? Whatever, mm. whatever, whatever day it was. And it's back again this Tuesday then. Yeah. And uh, the key issue seemed to revolve about uh, a date towards the, uh, the end of November 2017. It revolved and the case collapsed, the civil case, well, it was, it was collapsed from the Scottish government point of view on the basis that the person that was appointed to do the, the second stage of the inquiry, if you look at the detail into it, was also involved at the first stage. In other words, was involved with the, p the potential first complainers. Now, there's, there is a, a lot. We've still got that to be examined. Mm. Well, I well, mean, the, the two things that stood out to me were the fact that somebody had interviewed a complainant before this was in place, before the actual mm -hmm. procedure was in place, and became part of the decision-making team whether an inquiry against Simon should go ahead. That was the... Perceived bias was, I think, the way the court put it. But there was also the other standout for me was the fact that one of the complainants was approached and basically asked if the system they were about to put into place for complaints was to her liking. Mm. Yeah, um, that, 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 Evans that, that, described it as lived experience. I will. Mm. Now, there, now, Evans, her, her role in this, at this stage is crucial to the argument at the moment as well. Judith McKinnon, who's head of HR or whatever they call it nowadays, the, the question is, did she appoint whoever she appointed to take over sec part two of the, the inquiry? Or did Leslie Evans appoint Judith McKinnon to do so? And this is not yet clear. Now, if, if, and so there is still an argument about the usual story, how much did Leslie Evans know and when? Yeah, I think, I think what we're going to see, particularly from the civil servant, is as, they will do as much as possible to muddy the waters around the timelines about when decisions were taken, why they were taken, and who knew that they had been taken. Because the clearer that the timeline becomes and the clearer of the chain of who took those decisions, then we might actually get to some. And I don't think any of the civil servants want us to get to any of the detail. Well, that's, a very, that's a very fair point. <coughs> I, I don't think any of the civil servants do. Okay, hmm. okay, right. We want to know, but do we have the right to know is my question. I mean, there are rules about confidentiality, especially between civil servants and ministers. Now that is there to protect ministers, not to protect civil servants. Okay, well, can I just throw Leslie Evans, Leslie Evans' name back into it? As far as I could read, I've gone into the detail after last Tuesday, Leslie Evans was supposedly not informed for quite a time after November 2017 about what was going on. Yeah, but she, I mean, and there's almost an obligation on somebody in her position to, t to stay ignorant before she makes decisions on evidence put before her. But remember, she, the, 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 the inquiry convener, Linda Fabiani, refused to allow Leslie Evans to be pursued on the point Leslie Evans said she didn't, she didn't want to answer, she didn't need to answer. Well, the inquiry isn't about Alex Salmon. It's about Leslie Evans then. No, the inquiry okay. is about the process that set it up and why it failed to be fit for purpose. Yeah, but seriously, mate, there's a couple of interesting things in the, in the article that 
need investigating, and presumably that's where the part. I'm assuming that McWhorter has published them just to make sure that that's where it goes. The investigating officials under Miss Evans acted improperly in contacting the historic complainant before the new disciplinary procedure got underway. But we know that. So this yes, this, this, this yes, refers to a complaint that was lodged in 2013 and was sorted under the old disciplinary code and they were going back to revisit it because Miss Evans and Miss McKinnon weren't satisfied that the old disciplinary procedure had been robust enough. Mm. And, our, and our First Minister is going to get, they're going to attempt to drag Nicola into it, but McWhorter goes on to say, and he's quite right on that regard, that Nicola Sturgeon's a clever cookie. She's a lawyer herself, and what she knew and when she knew it will be couched in such very careful legal language that the mud, he thinks anyway, that the mud that they are attempting to stick to her throughout all of this will just wipe off when he, when he amounts to anything. The, the, problem, the, the real problem here for me is going to end up being which hat Nicholas Sturgeon knew which information under. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds ridiculous because she's only got one head to put the hats on. I bet you're right. But, but she's got obligations to the SNP. She's got obligations to the Scottish government. She's got obligations to her cabinet, to the parliament. And you know, as a human and being. There, is, there are things she could have discussed that had nothing to do with Salmon's guilt or innocence. For instance, about the impact, guilty or innocent, it would have on the SNP as a party. What would be the best outcome for Nicola Sturgeon? I would suggest it would be that by the time she found out what was going on, it was too late for her to do anything about it. That's probably her best outcome, isn't it? No, she, there's no good outcome for Nicola Sturgeon here. There simply isn't, because regardless of what the outcome is, even if she is totally exonerated, doesn't he get a wrist slap, acted totally in every way, in the correct way, the papers and the opposition will still attempt to smear her. There's still got to be a best option for her out no, of all they, possible it's options. A, Stuart, the whole thing's a joke. This ah, is yeah. not a vehicle to discover whether the system worked or not. This is a vehicle to attack, attack the SNP. And Murdo Fraser and Cole Hamilton proved ah, that on the first day. And, Jack, and Jackie Bailey. Yeah, well, Jackie Bailey took another... Jackie Bailey took what I think is a legitimate route Jackie Bailey didn't go asking questions about the Alex Salmon case. She asked questions about the procedures, the timelines, and who knew. And that's legitimate because that, well, that goes to this yeah, cons but, conspiracy <clears throat> theory. Yeah, but the, the three of them wrote, jo wrote a joint letter complaining, that to, didn't, wasn't it, to the head of the UK Civil Service complaining about the fact that uh, Leslie Evans refused to answer. So they joined, they, they were united in that. Well, yeah, but I mean, anybody that's read the reference of, of the inquiry knows that what, well, certainly Cole Hamilton and Fraser went right off piste. And it's yes. their own fault for not basically, I mean, they can't go after Salmond because he's no longer a politician. No, what, what they asked, what Murdo Fraser asked, had nothing to do with the inquiry. What Murdo really? Fraser asked was a point that was laid in evidence in the court. By, in the court. And that's nothing to do with the remit of the inquiry. The remit of the inquiry is to investigate how this procedure, or disciplinary procedure, came about, exactly when and how it was, free, it was written and put into place, and how it failed so badly. And the did Sturgeon the government five hundred and twelve thousand pounds for Alex Salmon's legal fees? God only knows how much it costs for their own legal fees. By the way, we've never been told that. But I'm well, assuming north of a million pounds total so far. Then they've spent the same, at least the same again, on a police investigation. But it's also, is it not looking into whether Sturgeon broke the ministerial code? There's. 
Or is I'm that a separate a, inquiry? I'm not so sure on that, mate. That, that has become a focus of people who are part of the inquiry. Whether they're allowed to go that deep, I'm not so sure. Um, again, with the timeline of when Nicholas, what Nicholas Sturgeon said to Parliament, that's open season. Anything you say in the chamber, you're accountable for. Okay, well, can I just, we've got Tuesday coming up, presumably we'll watch the start of Tuesday's inquiry. We may not watch it all because <laughs> they can go on for a long time. Who are we expecting to turn up and say anything interesting on Tuesday? I don't know who's... I can't remember. I, I have no idea who the witnesses are. Uh, basically, can are, I, we, are we going to get any more illumination on Tuesday? Well, or do we have to wait? On, on that subject, can I suggest we turn the question that Stuart just asked round on its head? What is the worst outcome for Sturgeon? And I think that uh, answering that question will give us a good insight into what the committee will ask witnesses. The worst outcome for Sturgeon is there's either a minute of a meeting or somebody's recorded a meeting at which she is seen to be trying to assist Alex Salmond in any way. Well, we know who is... From the moment that this disciplinary proceeding started, she knew about the allegation. She must have known about what happened in 2013. She must have known that they were going back to reinvestigate that. So at no point could she give any assistance to Mr. Salmon. Well, we know who the key witness is. The key witness is Liz Lloyd, uh, Nicola Sturgeon's chief of staff. And she's been there in post for a long time. And she was the one whose the, the, the government collapsed the case, uh, the, the civil case, to stop her giving evidence. She's not a witness. They, they collapsed the case to stop her giving evidence in the first case. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And she's refused, not a witness. And, and, the, and she's refused to give evidence in this inquiry. So, so why did you call her a witness? She's not going to appear. She refuses to appear. She's so. not appearing. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not here to talk about law. I'm simply saying she, she's not, she is a key actor in this issue. Mm -hmm. And she's not choosing to appear, which makes the, the entire thing a bit toothless, in my opinion, because if but, we're not going to get to the bottom of it, why bother Dell jumping in the mud in the first place? But look, let's put it this way, I'll sum it up quicker than that. Who knows what? She knows more than most. And without her evidence, well, where are they going? I'm, I'm sorry. You guys are jumping on the, this is the second court case bandwagon. This is a parliamentary inquiry. There are rules about who and who can appear, what they can say when they appear, it's not a court of law. It looks like a court of law, I'll grant you that, but it's not a court of law. Have we been given a decent reason for why Liz Lloyd is choosing not to appear? I would suggest that we heard one. I would suggest that the reason she's not appearing is a red herring. I think it's the SNP doing what they very well do very well. They're dead catting somebody. Like guys. This is the First Minister. People protect her position. There are things she does not get told before she needs to be told about this sort of crap. This is a political trial, not a legal trial. It's all politics. But she was... And we should remember room. that. She was in the room at the meeting with Jeff Aberdeen that she didn't allude to. So what? So what happened in that room at that time? <laughs> Nobody knows because they were discussing the colour of the tablecloths at the next SNP conference. They absolutely could have been made, but I bet you Jeff Aberdeen's got something to say about what happened at that meeting if he gets called. Well, she can't control Jeff Aberdeen. No. Uh, again, again, who knows? Loyalty to the SNP, loyalty, loyalty to the yes. And don't do that Loyal either. This is politics, guys. Well, that is politics. Loyalty, loyalist, lo loyalty to the SNP party, or is it loyalty to the yes cause? Who knows? The people will make decisions based on these as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, the papers want it to be a second salmon trial. You guys are sounding like you want that as well. This is politics. I want to do exactly. This is smear and innuendo. 
No, I, I, no, it's not meant to be anything about smearing innuendo. It's meant to be getting to the bottom of why extraordinarily well-paid civil servants instituted a, code, a disciplinary code that has been an absolute box of turd. This cost millions of pounds to the Scottish Exchequer. It's the only people who are happy with what has happened in this are journalists, because it's given them an excuse to write hit piece after hit piece about well, the Yes I, movement, about the SNP, and about the big players within the party. I, the one thing I want to know is, and I'll never get to know because they won't issue it, is the legal advice on making this retrospective. Yeah, well, there you go. I tell you, what, there, it's a bit, there is one thing that's already come out about this. We've discovered just where some of the loyalties of the well-known journalists in Scotland lie. A bit like discovering just where the loyalties of all the journalists that turn up for Nicola Sturgeon's press briefings. They didn't expect, this is a side, we've discovered stuff that we didn't know before, just watching them day after day, the way they're behaving. So in, in a, a similar way, the way that the reaction to the, in particular, Kirsty Works program, we've discovered just where the loyalties of quite a few well-known Scottish journalists lie. I would suggest that we didn't need that to know where the loyalties I, lie. I, 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 would, I, would, I would suggest that... Um, the most, ones that are saying nothing we already knew were unionists. No, I would say even clearer, mate. The ones that have stayed out of this are the ones who may actually write balanced pieces now and again. We're going to move on to Stuart Cosgrove. Stuart Cosgrove's never had a lot to say about Let's the do that now, Alan Jimmy. Diamond affair, and I think that's to his credit that he's maybe recognised it as a, a, a totally flinging exercise, and has decided to just put his brolly up and let the totally go either side. This is time. Stuart Cosgrove's piece in the National. Um, do you yeah. want to give us a wee pr press say of it? Well, it went it went in quite a few directions, mate. Um, he's basically having a wee pop at Scottish Twitter at one point because, like we've said before, the the reaction on Twitter sometimes, particularly in Scottish political Twitter circles, can be somewhat extreme to even the smallest thing happening. But, um, I it's interesting, mate. It goes on about the numbers and the poll numbers and how very quickly, as it looks... Well, it doesn't look. The reality is that the poll numbers have been going one way for some considerable time. And there's a major panic setting in, both in London, but I'd also say the the um, the outliers, the the way that London, the people who react and say the things that London can't quite say. So you've got your George Galloway's and your... He's, he's particularly his military sidekick. He's too IC in the party. Is it Tony and military sidekick? It Aye, like. he's, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That phrase about Shergar's bum that I'm not allowed to use anymore. But, um, aye. His, his article this week, uh, his piece this week, is quite distasteful. Stuart Cosgrove absolutely rips him a new one for it. Um, I personally think there's a lot more to come. I think this is just the start of a wave of turd that's headed our way. They're trying to drown us in turd and we're all going to be up to our necks and it's shouting, don't make waves. Mm -hmm. is... Well, I think it's, 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 it's he's, Stuart Cosgrove is uh, quite an important journalist to, to consider to, uh, from two angles. As you well know, Jimmy, he's, he's very popular amongst football fans. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 up until fairly recently, he was senior commissioning editor in Scotland for Channel 4. So he had a lot of power there. And he's, if you read his article regularly in the Sunday National, he's very careful, very treads, treads water. Think about it. You really don't want to upset an awful lot of football fans. I mean, he's a, he's a genuine St. Johnson fan, so he doesn't get dragged into the Rangers versus Celtic. But on the other hand, there is the old firm versus the rest argument. So he's very careful what he says in, <laughs> on live radio too. So you can, be, you can be certain that this was carefully put. I, I liked one thing, one point that he made there in, in the article was he's got a child, two children by the sounds of it. 
One of them's Generation X and the other one's Generation Z. I assume Generation Z is the youngest one. And he seemed to be alluding to, he talked about progressive. We, uh, did we discuss the, the, the question of what was progressive politics earlier, earlier this week, or was that just in my heat? But no, we did. He did the, the suggestion is that, given, look at the polls. Uh, the polls showed that under, the 20, under 25, it's 72% in favor in, of independence. Now, we also know that that generation is what us old folk would call woke. They are interested in issues that us old folks are possibly not that interested in. And yet, obviously, if they're going to turn out and vote, then the policies of the SNP go support that the, are attractive to that generation could be more important than we, that you and me might think. I'd like to start by congratulating Jimmy on becoming an old folk. I'll send you out the old folk T-shirt to me. Bali. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not Generation X, that's for sure. I must say, um, I, I kind of think what Stuart Crosgrove piece underlines what I think I said yesterday about I'm not sure that anything can dent the SNP at the moment. I'm really not. Um, I, I, I think it was Stuart Gro Cosgrove that said by 2021, by the election in 2021, support for independence could be at 60%. I think that was Gordon McIntyre Kemp you're thinking about. No, I didn't read anything by him today. Oh, Somebody you... today said it in the paper. Yeah, all right. And that's my position. I I think there's going to be a 1% rise in every poll that comes along right up until May. I well, don't think... Well, the I don't issue think, is Brexit, it, isn't it? Well, Brexit hasn't hit yet. Well, but but I don't... Big, I'm really big, talking about... One damage to the SNP. It's almost as if everything the unionists do in, attempt, in an attempt to damage the SNP backfires. Uh, I mean, uh, there's, there's a couple of brilliant bits in that, mate, that he points that out. You know, it staggers me that so many bright people in the Labour and Lib Dems still see independence as a malign nationalist movement bristling on the brink of foaming fascism. Yeah, That's no, exactly that was... the kind of thing that that donut for Alliance of Unity was alluding to this mm -hmm. week. And frankly, the more that the mainstream parties even hint that they agree with nonsense like that, it's the, they push more people into the yes camp every day. Stuart, you've been saying for months now that they're doing their work for us. And it's absolutely right. When, I mean, even, even this nonsense with Fat Boris only managing to spend three days in his cottage and people saying that the Scots drove him home. You'll forgive me, I seen something last night on social media that absolutely said categorically that that cottage was only rented for three days. He didn't go home early. This whole thing was made up to make it look bad, to make us look bad in front of the English electorate. Yeah, well, apparently he's probably gone to Greece to celebrate his father's 80th birthday. Well, I mean... I don't care. Neil, Neil Oliver insinuating that he was driven out by nobody turning up to wave a banner at him. Was, <laughs> was he disappointed he didn't get a demonstration at his door, so he went home? Uh, well, possibly. You know, uh, I mean, it's crazy. Even the, even the midges didn't bite Boris because at the end of the day, who wants to bite the undead? Well, somebody should put that Neil Oliver out of his misery. He's got a single bullet rattling about inside his tinfoil hat, and Aye. it's not hitting the target hard enough. I'd agree with you on that. I think Neil Oliver needs to go back to New Zealand, where apparently he was perfectly happy last year until the BBC um, drew him back to make another series. But go back to New Zealand, mate, and you're quite comfy out there, and your accent opens a few doors because... Well, that he's level, living in the 50s. He'll fit right in in New Zealand. That, le aye, that level of simpering unity is past its sell-by date in your own country. If you are so desperate to make excuses for the worst excesses of the union, I mean, this is, this is a... He's not quite come out with it yet, but this, this is a man that would blame the Irish potato famine on the Irish. You'd blame them rather than the politics bad, of the US Bad government. husbandry pa uh, well, practices. 
You don't want to go there this week. For, 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 Aye. And, because and, the, I mean, the British government at the time blamed it on the Irish landlords. Aye. I mean, seriously, what, what was it called the Highland Clearances? Relocation. A relocation of people when other people... I didn't think it was ethnic cleansing. I think it was policy to clear the... Particularly to, to clear the glens because the UK government, or what preceded the UK government, the English government, had had 300 years of getting their asses kicked when the Highlanders came out the glens, decided to fight, decided to unite, and the only way to stop that was to get rid of them, send them to the colonies. Stuart, anything particular well, that hit you? Well, uh, just one last thing about the Stuart Cosgrove thing. It said here the most revealing issue that broke this week was the franchise itself. Fascinating to see so many curdled commentators. I've never seen those two words together before. Oh, here, curdled commentators concede that there will be a referendum and have moved on to the question of who should be allowed to vote. So, um, he's, I, I, I've still got a lot of respect for Stuart Cosby. Um, the other thing that came up, I think, you were asking about is the question of this, well, the success of Martin Keating's raising £150,000 for his legal challenge to Section 30. And, of course, Pete Warrior, or also known as Andrew Tickell, generally speaking, is fairly widely respected. He's not the sort of guy that dips his toe into rows on social media and things. He uh, gives a quite a, de quite a detailed analysis of this proposed court case. And, it, and generally, he sums it up as um, there were others around saying, oh, this is too dangerous, this is dangerous. What if the case is lost? This could be terrible, bad news for the, for the campaign. Well, he doesn't go that far. He does sort of think, though, that the money could be wasted and that, no, the, the, the most likely uh, outcome will be just, uh, it'll just be delayed. It won't be, there won't be an outcome. Because what he court... effectively says is the, the court can't make an, ad, an adjudication on it because there is not law specific that they can look at. Well, there's no, it's, it, it's, it's, it's theoretical, it's hypothetical, and they don't like giving answers. On well, they can't. Because well, they they're, they're there to make decisions about law. And, and, there and is if another, there isn't law there, they can't make a decision. And there is another point. The, the, the QC that they've hired, Aidan O'Neill, what did he say? Let me see. For, for, apparently, he's got history of actually hmm. uh, uh, not agreeing with the, own, with the outcome that he's supposedly arguing for. Well, that, I mean, that's part of the non-written constitution's strength is the courts cannot make a decision on issues of the Constitution because it's no written down. So they make decisions on law that affects the Constitution. Mm, and uh, Andrew Tickell also points out that he, was, he thought that um, it's, it's important to refer back to the Edinburgh Agreement because that was where the Section 30, the gold standard, as everybody talks about, came into being. And uh, Alex Salmond apparently did really well to avoid getting involved in, in a legal argument over Section 30 at the time. Yeah, because it left the question open and can still be used. Question as, unanswered. It can well, be used as leverage. The, well, the question is if whether, whether the, the, uh, the Scotland Act uh, uh, gives room for the, a Scottish government to hold a referendum without permission from London. That's important. Isn't that, what, that isn't that what Section 30 is for, though? Section 30 is specifically put into that agreement to, to leave room, to leave wriggle room so that they can pop other things in. Well, it it was effectively also, allows for the, for the London government to do almost anything. Yeah, well, but it was also to, to, that if the, the referendum had been won by the yes side, that there would be immediate recognition by London of the rights of, of <clears throat> independence, not, un, not turning around and say, oh, you know, Aye, and that, coming and in line about it. A lot of commentators look at that, that specific um, point cool. as being Salmon's great victory because he got the UK government to accept and put down in a legal framework that Scots can vote for their independence. They're now physically telling us we can't have a vote, but they did in 2012 agree that if Scots vote to be independent, Scotland can be independent. 
That might very well be, I mean, who knows how things are going to work out over the next couple of years, but that might very well be Salmon's crowning glory. I, I, got the English to I just have a team. feeling that Andrew Tickell's hit the nail on the head here. I think this could end up being a bit of a damp squid. I think it's 155 grand worth of damp squid plus whatever they've already, because this is a second crowdfunding, isn't it? So, and of course, the, the argument is it was, it was started to be raised at a time when there wasn't nothing much happening, shall we say, in the movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so times have changed. Times change very quickly at the moment. That's true. That's true. Or should I say the <laughs> circumstances change very quickly at the moment. Sorry. Mm. Mm. Um, anybody got anything else you want to bring up? Just the uh, anniversary today. 715 years since they slaughtered Wallace. That traitorous bastard, Wallace. That's the one. Aye, aye. Aye. But, um, it's, Never it's swore all... fealty to the man that executed him. That one. It's always interesting to remember that um, seven, seven centuries, more than seven centuries later, the name is still held in pretty high esteem by most Scots. They're not interested in a daft movie made 20 odd years ago by a wee Australian that was half the size of the real Wallace. Um, they're interested in what Wallace stood for, which was freedom, independence, a nation. And weirdly enough, we're still arguing about it, but these things still mean roughly the same thing, don't they? They should do. They should do. I'd like to just re reference uh, Gordon McIntyre Kemp because the what's Believe in Scotland, the new campaign we mentioned it the other day, it's gathering momentum. And he hinted, he hints in, a, in a, an article today that there are strategies. They do actually have a secret plan. He doesn't mention it, doesn't use the word secret, but he hints that, uh, yes, there is a Aye. secret plan. Well, there will be strategies, but I can, and I've always argued that you don't tell your enemy what you're about to do. And he should know, because he's the guy that's been polling. He's not going to publish all everything they've polled for. Oh. I worry about some of the language he uses on his Facebook page. But then you know, I, you can me, I'm a cynical swine. And frankly, anybody that sets themselves up in a leadership role, I'd cheerfully take a baseball bat to the back of their head at times. So I shall hang on to my worries for now. But I will let's put it this way. Um, Gordon McIntyre's article we get a response from Peter Bell this morning, so which, as usual, it'd be worth, it's worth reading in that context. They, they don't particularly get on very well, those two, do they? Uh, I'm not sure they do. I, okay, this isn't one of my predictions. This is a possible unseen problem over the mm -hmm. horizon. There are now, I think, three different groups vying to lead the Yes movement. Um, Scottish Convention, McIntyre Kemp looks like he's making a move. I can't remember who the third one is, so it can't be that important. But th this could be a spark point. This could be something we're not considering a problem, but might end up being a problem. The Scottish Convention are more towards the common wheel, Brother Caledonia end. Um, yeah, but... Gordon McIntyre Kemp, I'm quoted, I'm sure I can find it, but not I'm sitting here now, that he's virtually the... He's got official support from the SNP. Uh, who's the third one? I see. By the way, if he came out and said that, he's a brave man. He's I got official it. support from the SNP. No, I'm suggesting he has from the way something he said the other day. Put it in print. I can find it for tomorrow. So what you actually mean is you think he's got unofficial support from the SNP? Yes. Mm. Right. But okay. It, we claim that this uh, believe in the union is uh, believe in in Scotland is the new yes campaign and, and that he's leading it. Shall we say? Can, uh, well, I didn't that, read it that way, Stuart. He answer. can claim that all he wants. It's just a Facebook page that he's set up and he's get, he's having a getting a wee chubby at himself because he's got about three thousand followers. Well, I think well, I, I do. I, I, I think he's pretty close to the SNP leadership. Well, I do think we kind of need to keep an eye on this because it could become a point of friction. Um, you think left, right, and in the middle. You could think there could be a too many chiefs moment. 
Yes, I do. I'm happy to go. I'm happy to go a scalping if there's too many chiefs. I'll get the tomahawk well, hook along with the baseball bat. I think it's a, you're right. It's inevitable. I'm just mm. well. It's a much good. more. It's looking like a much more attractive position than it was in 2014. Well, aye, because we're we're going to win. Aye. If, so, you, if you're the person that's seen as being in the vanguard of the yes movement, because the yes movement will, regardless of what people say, that when the push comes to independence, the yes movement will fill in all the gaps. They will fall in behind SNP and push us over the line. If you're the person that's seen to have done that, you'll get yourself a nice fancy title and probably a, a, probably a number on about 70 grand minimum a year. That, and at the I, end of the day, mate, there's a lot of people out there that didn't make anything like that kind of money and we'd bite your hand off for a job on that kind of job. I, I just well, do, I think we have to be wary mm-hmm. that it doesn't become a matter of friction and we end up with three different yes groups all vying for places, one place on platforms. Well, I still, I think at the moment, given we're going to need the broadest church in the mm-hmm. yes campaign and the, with our experience of the 2014 referendum, I'm part, I'm part of the school of thought that thought the SNP were far too hard and on with the, the yes campaign there. I think a, a, a separate yes campaign with a, a, a gap between them and the SNP would be a better outcome. I think I, any, gap, any gap, you're just giving them an opportunity to slip, slip wedges in there. I think the yes campaign has to fall in behind the SNP and the SNP take us to India. I'm kind of of that view. The leadership in the Yes campaign was not that strong. I think that was one of its strengths, was that it was a massive campaign. But I remember sitting watching Report in Scotland when I was still stupid enough to watch the BBC of an evening and being absolutely... You know, I was kicking my own height when I seen Mary Black on the back of that wagon with Jim Sillers. I was kicking my own height when I saw that uh, the, the boy that's the MP now running about Scotland in his, in his fire engine. That was Neil Gray. Aye, aye, aye. There was just loads of great things going on. That well, Neil Gray. National. Aye, it was him with the fire engine, wasn't it? No. Um, no, it mind Chris, his the, the, the Chris yeah. Law, is it? The Chris MP Law. Dundee. Oh, sorry, but Chris Law. The, we met him up in the... Aye, the there was hundreds Polish of people box. that came for the grassroots. Right. And I, I'm not certain that the Yes movement itself needs leaders. If we, if another campaign comes around, again, you'd hope it would grow, grow yeah. from the ground up. But I, yeah, I think the I most think, exciting section was the, what they called National Collective. Loads and loads of young people. I remember the Saturday they had Princess Street. They had all kinds of weird, weird and wonderful things happening on Princess Street that only 20-year-olds would dream up. Well, I, I my, my complaint has never been about the grassroots yes movement. It was innovative and very invigorating. But I did have a problem with what's his name, the XSTV guy. Can't even remember his name now. His second name was Blair. Can't you mind? Oh, no, his first name was Blair. Blair somebody. Oh, Blair Jenkins. Blair Jenkins. I was not impressed with him. We, we need a stronger figure than him if there is to be leadership. I would suggest if there is leadership, nobody from the surname clan gets to lead. If you're going to, if you're going to lead anything, you should have a proper first name, not a surname as a first name. Aye, aye, so like we're counting out Jimmy. Stuart, 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 Stuart. <laughs> of Muck Stuart. Hey, if Stuart of Mick Stuart comes down for Stuart Glenn and decides to lead the clan Stuart in a prance along Princess Street in their battle dress, I'll cheerfully join in, mate. You can become an honorary Muck Stewart. Talking of which, there's a hands off our parliament thing this Thursday, gentlemen. Are we going to go out and maybe do an outside right. broadcast? We could mm. film a segment. Thursday's a bad day. FMQ is a bad day, isn't it? Because you've got FMQs. Uh, well, have a think about it. Anyway, guys, thanks very much. Um, I've got seafood to eat shortly, so I'm very going to go nice. Now. Where are we off to? Uh, we're not. We're having it delivered. The King's oh Walk my. apparently does a seafood. Hold it. You're getting, a, you're getting a delivery for the King's Walk. Aye. Could you be a little bit more middle class today, please, Mum? No. No. I, I have never hidden my working class roots that have morphed into middle class roots, mate. 
Well, that I suppose that comes about when you go egg chasing for a large percentage well, of your and I had an iPad just about before anybody else in my family, so you know, <clears> I can't <throat> deny being middle class. I'm a scheming mate, I called it an iPad for about a year before I realised it was an, an iPad. iPad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> yeah, thank right. you, uh, Jimmy. You thank you, yeah. Stuart Lockhead. I'm Norris Stuart. Thanks for listening, folks, and we'll catch you on Monday, which is, in fact, tomorrow. Bye for now.